Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Keezer with Applied Flow Technology, and I would love to thank all of you for joining in on today's webinar on pump and system interaction. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and for those of you who are listening in live, I did include a PDF of my presentation, and that way you could have it for uh, your reference. Um, and if you are listening to the recorded version, feel free to email me at benkeiser at aft.com. That's B-E-N-K-E-I-S-E-R at aft.com. And I'll be happy to send you a copy of it. And uh, for those of you who are listening live, you'll be sent a, a link to the recording later on this week. And you can watch it again or you can send it around to your colleagues. And then for those of you listening to the recording, thank you very much for joining us. All right. There's a lot to talk about today. So I'm just going to go ahead and get right to it. And here's what we're going to be talking about today. What is a system curve and what is it good for? Um, where does it bring value? Everybody seems to care so much about having a system curve. Why is it important? And then we'll go into how to generate system curves for different types of situations. So uh, we're going to talk about what a uh, friction dominated system is versus what a static dominated system is. We'll look at the effects of manual throttling valves versus control valves and how those will affect the generation of a system curve. We'll also take a look at the affinity laws. Uh, we'll get into talking about parallel composite curves when you have multiple pumps operating in parallel. Uh, there's oftentimes where the answer that you think is to get more flow, just put more pumps in parallel. And that is just not true. And you're going to learn why. And we'll get into that later on in this webinar. We'll also go into the uh, complexities and the effects of when you have uh, pumps that are not the same, or if you have uh, flow splits that are not equal for pumping in uh, parallel pump systems. So we'll take a look at that. We'll also see what it looks like with uh, having uh, series, uh, uh, pumps in series and what their composite curves look like. Uh, we'll look at complex curves for multiple branch uh, flow paths. We'll see what it looks like when you have different liquid elevations, system curves that change over time. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more about the effective control features. When you can have multiple system curves for a single system, uh, we'll also look at problems creating system curves. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna be showing you examples all throughout the webinar. So, Again, system curves is one of those uh, things that everybody really wants to be able to get and generate, and it's trivial for Fathom to be able to generate them for you. When you're using AFT Fathom, it's really, really simple to get a pump and system curve for just about any type of system that you want. However, the issue is there are a lot of cases where a single system curve does not exist and we're going to go into examples of those situations here later today so it's just as important to understand how system curves are created and what their implications are and also to understand their limitations and when they may not be very helpful uh, they can still provide some value but when they start to get into limitations for really complicated systems, that's where you're going to want to use other ways of examining the results in your system. Now, uh, to help with that, if you were to go to our webinar page, then you'd be able to register for our webinars. And the webinar that we'll be doing here in two weeks we're gonna talk about some really useful tips and tricks for reporting results in different ways with AFT software. So today we're focusing specifically on how to generate pump and system curves within AFT Fathom. 
And then in the next webinar in a couple of weeks, I'm going to go into detail on the other ways that you can examine your results, which will give you a lot more information than simply what a puppet system curve can do for can do for you. All right, so let me go ahead and get this out of the way. Give me just one moment here. All right. So here's all the stuff that we're talking about today, and let's get into it. So pump and systems. Pumps, uh, their job is to overcome uh, frictional resistance as well as elevation changes in your piping systems. And so that's the job of a pump is to deliver flow and to overcome those two system aspects. And one of the ways that you would be able to quantify the static head is simply the difference in elevation between supply and discharge tanks or supply and discharge reservoirs. So uh, the key thing about the static head is that that will not change as the flow rate changes through your system. However, the frictional components of your system, that will change as your flow rate changes. So your frictional resistance is variable while your static resistance is uh, <laughs> static, it's the same. You can also have static head by simply uh, having pressure differences between the supply and discharge boundaries in your piping system. So an example is if you have pressurized tanks. If you have pressurized tanks where they both have the same liquid level, but one is a higher pressure than the other, that's another way that you can have a static head value even though the elevations would be the same so this is one way to quantify the static head difference in elevation and then the other way is where you have different pressures and so both of those will cause the same impact on what your uh, static head for the remaining uh, webinar today whenever i talk about static head I'm going to be uh, referring to the difference in elevation changes uh, rather than just having different pressures above the liquid surface level. So uh, that's what we're going to simplify today's discussion with. Now, when you have a very simple system with a single flow path, such as this case right here, quantifying the static head that your pump must be able to overcome in order to start generating any flow is really easy to quantify. So calculating this is very simple. However, when you get into a situation where you have maybe some multiple branch paths, perhaps uh, another uh, reservoir or two in your system, and maybe they all have different liquid elevations, the static head is not very clear in that particular case. And we're going to talk about that later on when we get into system curves for multiple branch flow paths. Uh, so for a simple single path, just like what we're talking about here, the static head is simply your change in elevation from the supply to discharge. So what is a system curve and what is it good for? How is it useful for you? System curves represent the required pressure increase in order to drive a fluid through your system at various flow rates. And so when you're dealing with pump and systems, it's really useful to uh, use uh, head instead of pressure and volumetric flow rate to quantify your system curves. And the reason for that is because of the pumps and how they're tested. Pumps would typically be tested with water, but you might be pumping some other system fluid in your network. Well, when you have different fluids, they're gonna have different densities. But the reason why uh, pump manufacturers provide your pump curve in terms of head instead of pressure or volumetric flow rate is because those two parameters are independent of density. Same thing goes for system curves as well. When you do not have any control features, uh, such as control valves in your system, then your pump and system curves are going to intersect at the operating point. 
And that's one of the key things of what a system curve is useful for, is it will graphically show you where a pump is going to operate for the pump head as well as the pump flow rate. And it's where your two curves intersect with each other. So in addition to demonstrating the pump behavior, they can also illustrate the proximity to the best efficiency point. One of the things that's really useful about AFT Fathom is when you're when you're using it to generate a pump and system curve, you can also cross plot the efficiency curve for the pump as well. And you want to be able to see the pump and system curves intersecting as close to the best efficiency point as possible. So that's another reason where the system curve and pump curve is useful, is being able to see how closely your curves are intersecting to the BEP. That's really what it's all about. The further away that you get from your best efficiency point, the more reliability problems that you're going to start having in your system. So this is where it's key to understand system curves and how they're generated and the situation where they may be a little bit ambiguous. And so when you look at a pump and system curve together, it can help identify really quickly how various pump or system modifications are going to affect your pump operating point. Now, once you start to have more complex systems, then the idea of a system curve just becomes <laughs> more and more uh, useless. Uh, for a lot of cases, it may not even be possible to generate a unique system curve. What am I talking about here? Well, let me show you an example. If you go to our website, AFT.com, under the Learning Center, you can find tons of case studies where our software was used for various uh, industry and um, useful applications. And so you can use these filters to drill down to find various case studies that might relate to you. And what I want to show you really quick here is this ground injection system that FlowServe did. Uh, they built a Fathom model of their uh, of this uh, brine injection system, which experienced 41 repairs over a five-year period, costing one and a quarter million dollars. This is what their piping system looks like. So. <laughs> You know, if somebody came up to you and said, hey, give me a pump and system curve for that, what in the world are they talking about? Well, when I start getting into the more complicated systems later on in this webinar, it's going to very clearly show you where a pump and system curve for a system like this is just, it's not going to be useful for you at all. <clears throat> this is where you're going to want to watch the webinar in two weeks about other types of reporting features to examine the results. So when you have a complicated system like this, this is where the usefulness for system curves can decrease dramatically. And the reason why is because there are several system curves for this single system that you can generate. All right. Back to the presentation here. All right, so what is a system curve? We've got a pump and we've got our pump curve and our system curve plotted together, and they're going to intersect at the operating flow rate. So the flow that you have through the pump, that's where your system is going to be operating at when those two curves intersect. So there's multiple components that are important to uh, know about with this system curve. The amount of head that the pump is providing to overcome the system resistance at the operating flow rate, that's called your total dynamic head, TDH. And so the total dynamic head is made up of different parts. One part is the static head. The static head shifts your system curve up and that is essentially the liquid elevation difference between your supply and discharge reservoirs. Again, the static head is not going to change with flow rate. It's going to be the same. This portion above the static head, that's known as your frictional head. The friction head is variable. 
So the resistance is going to change as your flow rate changes through that system. Excuse me. So those are the two pieces that make up your total dynamic head, static head and friction head. Now, friction and pump systems is occurring due to your piping losses, losses of, of pressure through valving, fittings, components like heat exchangers or filters, different things like that. And then you can also use frictional components to control your flow or pressure, such as using control valves, either flow control valves or pressure control valves. You can use orifice plates. Uh, that can be used to control your flow rate in your system or manual throttle, throttling valves. So each of those different aspects are going to make up the shape of what your system curve is going to look like. And again, it's useful to think of things in terms of head rather than pressure, A, because head does not have a, uh, uh, it's independent of uh, density when you're plotting your pump curves together. They can just measure what the head rise is, and that way it wouldn't depend on uh, density. But the real reason is when you do the different substitutions, it simply comes down to this, where the increase in head is based upon the resistance in your system times the flow rate squared. And because the flow rate squared, it's going to have a quadratic shape. So the higher the flow that you have, the significant uh, the higher your pressure drop is going to be through the system as that resistance increases at increasing flow rates. So that's just taken back to your uh, fluid mechanic fundamentals there. So uh, let's talk about a, uh, well, since I talked about the uh, uh, system curve here, let me show you an example in Fathom. <laughs> I'm going a little bit too fast for myself here. Okay. So this system here is what I'm going to use to illustrate how you would generate a pump and system curve in AFT Fathom. <clears throat> so in this piping system here, we've got six inch diameter piping. We have a tank with a liquid level of about 25 feet and we're pumping it up to a liquid level of 200 feet. So that's our elevation change is about 175 feet there. We've got a filter. We have a pump, we have a heat exchanger, and then finally we have a, uh, a throttling valve. Inside my pump, I've got a uh, pump curve. Uh, we have the head curve, MPSH curve, efficiency curve. Now one little tip, if you're using AFT Fathom version 10, there's a really useful new feature that came out with Fathom 10. If you were to open up the uh, area where you enter your pump and system curve data. This is all your raw data right here for the pump and system curve. There's another tab that you'll want to take a look at, and that's the configuration data tab. So if I go over to the configuration data tab, there's a new section in Fathom 10 that was there before. That's for the preferred operating region and allowable operating region. This is really useful because we have incorporated the uh, HI and API standards for the low end and high end of BEP proximity. So uh, good practice for the ANSI HI standard is to ensure that when your pump is operating, that it needs to operate within 70% to 120% of the best efficiency point. So when you go into this configuration data tab and you check this box to turn on that feature, it's going to generate something really useful when you go to do your pump and system curve plot. I'm going to show you that here in a sec. All right, so let me get out of all this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and run the model here really quick. <coughs> and what we could do is we could add up the head loss for the frictional losses in the pipes, as well as the head loss across each component. So we've got the head loss across our filter. We have a negative head loss across the pump. That is because 
your pump is increasing pressure. That's why it's negative. And then we have our head loss across the heat exchanger and the valve. So if we added all of those head losses together with the elevation difference, that would calculate the total dynamic head of the pump itself, which in this case is about 244 feet. Now, I'm not going to do that calculation. You can do it on your own, but essentially, that's exactly what you would see. So here's how you generate the pump and system curve in AFT Fathom. We'll go to the graph results window, and when you go to the graph results window, the default tab is to create a pump and system curve. So the first thing that you would do is choose your curve type. Right now, it's just going to be a single pump and system curve. Where this becomes more useful is later when you have parallel pumps or pumps in series, that's what allows you to do composite curves in those circumstances. But for right now, we're just doing a single curve for uh, the pump and system. And then you would choose which pump you want to generate it for. I only have one pump in my model. <coughs> Therefore, this is the pump I'm going to do a system curve for. The next thing is Fathom is going to establish a flow rate range that it's going to generate the system curve. So here's how Fathom generates the system curve for you. Even though I have specified a pump curve in the pump curve window here, when you go to generate that system curve, Fathom takes your model into the background and it's gonna change it to a pseudo sizing model. Why does it do that? Well, the reason why is because when it changes it in the background to a pseudo sizing option, it can specify a fixed flow rate. And it's going to run your model over a whole range of flow rates where it's a fixed flow value. What it does is it calculates the required pump head that you need to generate the specified flow rate. That's how it plots out the system curve. So uh, when we go back to the graph results window here, we've got the flow rate range and it will automatically determine a flow rate range for you based upon what your operating point is, but you can change it. Why might you change it? Maybe you wanna expand that flow rate out a little bit further. So if I click on user specified, Maybe I want to go out to 800 gallons per minute. I also want to show the efficiency curve on top of my pump and system curve, as well as the preferred operating region. Now, the number of data points is going to be defaulted to 30. So what Fathom is going to do is it's going to take this flow rate range, whatever the values are, and it's going to divide it by the number of data points, and that's how it calculates the individual flow rates that it's using to generate your system curve. Let's go ahead and use uh, 60 data points. That gives a little bit more resolution here. So we're gonna go ahead and generate our system curve. <laughs> I told you it was simple. It takes you know less than a second. It's really quick and easy. So if we break these parts down, here's our static head. So our static head is at about 175 feet. Now, why do these curves not go all the way back to zero? Well, that's because you wouldn't be able to actually run your model with a zero flow rate through the pump. It has to be greater than zero. Well, what could you do? If I wanted to get as close to zero as possible, simply go into the user-defined flow rate range and then maybe specify a value of 0.01 and then we can regenerate that curve, and there we go. So now you can see how that extends the curves back to essentially zero. The next thing I can do is if I click on this button right here in the graph results toolbar, this is going to show me all the different data points that were used for generating the pump curve, the system curve, efficiency curve, and the preferred operating region. So if I click on any of those uh, plus signs to expand them, I can click on any of these data points. And as you can see, 
that's going to put a little text bubble wherever those data points are. So if I want to go to my operating point, I can turn on my crosshair. My operating point is right around 500 gallons per minute. Well, if we take a look at the output window, the actual operating point is 500.3. Well, what we're doing is we're running the uh, Fathom model at several flow rates over the range that we have specified here. So if you wanted to be able to show you a data point at exactly 500.3 gallons per minute, then you're gonna need to specify uh, more and more data points just to be able to show that. So right here, this is close enough for what we're doing. So if I go to 501, I can show what that data point is. I can, whoops, I missed it. So there it is again, 500.1. Once you get that bubble to show, right click and say convert to annotation and bam. Now I've got myself an annotation that is always going to highlight my operating point for me. So here's the key thing about pump and system curves is not only do you care about where they are intersecting, but what's more important is where are they intersecting in relation to the efficiency curve. So the best efficiency point would be right about here. So that's gonna be the maximum efficiency that we see for our pump. And that's where we want these curves to intersect as closely to as possible. The preferred operating region, again, is based upon the ANSI-HI standard, and you wanna at least ensure that you're operating within that region, anywhere from 70% of BEP to 120% of BEP. So one thing that you care about is where the curves intersect, but more importantly, where are they intersecting in relation to that best efficiency point? <clears throat> and when you're using AFT Fathom, it makes it really easy to be able to see exactly where you're operating because you can include your efficiency curve as long as you have your efficiency data. Now, there's a lot of different things that can cause your system curve to change as well as your pump curve to change. And we're going to talk about all those different aspects here. But this is how you would be able to generate your pump and system curve uh, on the spot. Now, once you do this, you don't want to have to reset these parameters every single time. That's a pain. Instead, once you generate your curve once, click on this folder with a blue plus sign and give it a name. What that will do is it's going to file away your pump and system curve or any type of curve in the graph list manager. The graph list manager is a very useful filing system for all the types of graphs that you want to generate. Now, I've already done that. When I get to the part where I start talking about manual throttling valves, that's for this particular scenario here. When I go to run that scenario and then I want to generate a new pump and system curve for it, instead of having to reset any of these parameters here, I'm not gonna have to do that. Since my curve is already generated, all I would need to do is just double click on the graph list item in the manager here and bam, it regenerates it on the spot for any scenario that this graph is applicable to. All right. So that's our very simple system. And a system curve is really useful for a simple single flow path like this, because when you develop your system curve with relation to the pump, that will do a really good job at illustrating for you the overall system resistance for the entire system. But once we get to the step where we're doing multiple system, uh, multiple branches, it's a lot more complicated than that. All right, let me go back into my presentation here. All right. So now we're gonna talk about what a purely frictional system curve is. Again, we have the two components. We have the static head 
and then we have the friction head and those two components on your system curve added together that's what generates your total dynamic head at the operating point now if we consider a purely frictional system that means that your uh, your system curve is going to go through the origin so at zero flow you're going to have zero head loss so here's an example let's say that you have two separate reservoirs those are very large bodies of water and you want to pump fluid from one reservoir to another and you actually do not have any elevation changes at all if you have this type of system there's going to be no static head your system curve is going to flow or it's going to go right through the origin what this means is any pump will be able to start generating flow there's no static head or elevation change that your pump has to overcome to start generating flow when you have a purely frictional system so your system resistance is only made up by frictional head and that's the variable portion there now one note here is that closed systems are always purely frictional so when you have a closed loop network and you want to generate a pump and system curve for it you will see the system curve go through the origin in that particular case so any pump can generate flow no elevation overcome now let's talk about a static dominated system when you have elevation differences the uh, supplier discharge elevation is changed that's where your system curve could shift up and down so here's an example of what that looks like i have a supply tank which has a liquid elevation lower than the discharge tank so that difference in liquid level is my static head so in order to generate any flow at all through your system your pump has to be able to generate at least this much head rise to start generating any flow now this particular pump that we're actually using generates a lot more head at zero flow so it will work for your system but there are some unique aspects of this for the case of if you're trying to prime a system or not so if you're trying to prime a system there might be some siphon effects and high points that are intermediate you might need a if your pump uh curve looks like this but the actual pump that needs to overcome any uh, amount of uh head for a intermediate high point maybe you need a little bit more in that case <clears throat> now i'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that but let me show you what i'm talking about let's see make sure that all of you can see this you can okay so if you've not checked out our tips and tricks uh page on our website be sure that you do so if you go to learning center under tips and tricks this is where you can find lots of excellent blog articles that we've written on how to use the software more effectively and efficiently and if you do a keyword search for overcoming new heights that is going to bring up this blog article that I wrote a while ago and this is going to illustrate that aspect of priming a system where your initial pump curve may not be high enough so this is where you can find the blog article that I was talking about to give you more detail on what I mentioned with elevation aspects <clears throat> so here's the case of when you're filling up a reservoir so you have your original system where the liquid heights are all at the uh, initial levels and then you start pumping from one tank to another well you have your old static head as well as your old friction when your liquid elevation differences change your static head is going to change and when your static head changes your flow rate is going to change it rides back on its curve because the static head has shifted up 
And here's the interesting thing is that that's actually going to decrease your frictional head loss. And the reason why it decreases the frictional head loss in your system is because you have a lower flow rate. So there's more static head that your pump has to overcome with the liquid elevation differences, but less frictional head. Again, why do you care about this? You know, wherever these two curves are intersecting, that's really not the uh, main thing that you care about. What's important is when you cross plot that efficiency curve, you wanna make sure that whenever you have a change in your system, you wanna pay attention to how your pump is operating in relation to the best efficiency point. Is these system changes causing your pump to operate closer to the BEP or further away from the BEP? There's another blog on our tips and tricks area that you can find about problems that start occurring when you're operating uh, over here on your pump curve versus over here on your pump curve. So if you are outside of the sweet spot where you need to operate your pump at, outside of that preferred operating range, that's where you're gonna start to have issues. And there's a really good blog that you can find that talks about that. All right. So here's another example of a static head dominated system. In a static head dominated system, the main goal for your pump is to overcome significant elevation changes. So that's pretty much all that the pump is doing. It will have frictional aspects to it that it needs to overcome, but the main job is to overcome uh, elevation change, and that's where your pump is going to have to just have a really high pressure. So here's what a pump and system curve would potentially look like when you have a static dominated system. As you can see, the main job for your pump is to, is to overcome that static head. The frictional head component is very, very small. Now, when we start looking at parallel pumps operating, this is where adding more pumps in parallel could potentially help generate more flow for you for static dominated systems. But when you have a frictional dominated system, we're gonna see what that looks like a little bit later, adding more pumps in parallel will not necessarily generate more flow for you. Okay, so now let's take a look at what pump and system curves would look like when you have manual throttling valves. So manual throttling valves, they're just gonna be stuck in one position once you change it to that position and it's not gonna change until you change it. So manual throttling valves are going to increase the amount of frictional head loss that you'll see in your system. So this is very similar to the uh, fathom model that I showed you before, where the valve is fully open and we've got our, our static head and our friction head, and that's where our curves are going to intersect at our operating point. When you throttle a valve and you uh, close it and increase the pressure loss across that throttling valve, it's going to change the shape of your system curve. Notice how your static head stayed exactly the same. That does not change with flow rate. However, when you throttle down a valve and you increase the pressure loss across the valve, your system curve becomes steeper. So that's a more frictionally dominated system in that aspect. So when it shifts or, or when it changes the shape, you can see that we have more frictional head losses in that case. So the key thing here is that our curves are still going to operate at the flow rate um, of the pump, and that's the flow rate through the valve, but it becomes a steeper curve. So the, cur the system curve itself changes when you change a uh, manual valve. So let me show you an example of this in my Fathom model here. So again, the first scenario here for my pump curve, this valve 
is initially open all the way. So it's got a very small K factor. It's 100% open. When you run that model and you look at the valve summary, we can calculate what the CV value is right here. So that's our CV value for a fully open valve. And this is what our pump and system curve looks like. So what I want you to pay attention to is where this operating point is going to change <clears throat> in relation to my preferred operating region. Does it get closer to the best efficiency point or does it go further away? So let me switch to that other scenario. So here's the scenario where our valve is throttled. Give me one second here. I apologize, I'm still overcoming the cold from last week. So if you hear me all of a sudden fade out for a second, just hang on tight and I'll be back on. All right, so if I open up this valve, in this particular scenario, I changed things up a little bit. What I did was I went to the optional tab and I clicked on this button right here to create a CV versus open percentage curve. So when I clicked on the uh, curve here, what I did was I set a initially an equal percent. When you do an equal percentage uh, type of valve, if you don't know already what your open percent versus CV curve is, then you can generate one for you. So here my fully open CV was like 1337 and then my percent increment is going to be 5%. And that's my CV versus open percentage curve. So this is what I already generated previously uh, before the webinar. So here's my CV versus open percentage curve. And instead of the valve being open percent to 100%, I want to run a case where my valve is only open 10%. So when you, when you specify that open percent versus CV table, it allows you to use this option right here where you might not know what your CV value is, but you know your open percentage. Well, you simply specify that open percentage and then it will calculate what that CV is for you. So this is going to add a lot more frictional loss into our system because the valve is only 10% open. So I've throttled it down significantly. What does our system curve look like? So when I run the model here, we can take a look at our pump and see that it's operating at 241 gallons per minute. It is 45% of the best efficiency point. But what we want to look at is our pump and system curve. So if I go to the graph results window, again, I don't have to go in and reset any of these parameters. I already made the graph. So all I need to do is just double click on that. And bam, there it is. So look at this here. Um, as you can see, the pump is not operating at all within our preferred operating region. And it's operating way back here on its curve. So this is going to help you really understand if you've got a problem in your system. And this will help you diagnose what's going on. So if you are experiencing operating problems on your pump, maybe your seals are wearing out, or maybe the uh, bearings need to be replaced, or you've got leakage or cavitation problems, different things like that. When you're able to see where your pump is gonna be operating in accordance with its system curve, and the key thing is it's getting further and further away from that BEP, that's gonna tell you that you've got some major problems. But again, the key thing is here, our system curve changed. Initially, it was within the preferred operating region and it became much, much steeper when he added all of that additional frictional resistance with the throttling valve. So that's how a system curve changes when you've got a throttling valve in play. A control valve, is different. So again, it moves our system curve for a throttling valve because that's extra frictional loss that stays the same, but it will change at the different flow rates. The When you have control valves in your system, 
the effect is going to be a lot different. So control valves, they do represent another uh, form of frictional head loss. Here's my system without a control valve. And this is what the pump and system curve will look like. So when I don't have a flow control valve, my pump and system curves are going to intersect where the pump naturally is going to operate. When I include a control valve in my system, maybe I reduce the flow rate. Well, here's the thing. When you reduce the flow rate with your control valve, that operating point, the flow rate is further back where your pump is going to be operating right here. But here's a really interesting aspect is when you have a control valve in place, your pump and system curves are not going to intersect at the operating point anymore. So they're not going to intersect right here. Your operating point is back over here. The difference between your pump curve and your system curve, that head difference, that's going to be the head loss across the control valve itself. Now, this is where pump and system curves start to get to be more complicated is because there are two ways that you can generate your system curve when you have the presence of a control valve in your system. And we're going to take a look at both of those. So here, when I have my flow control valve, the static head value, that stays the same the frictional head loss decreases, and I have a pressure loss across the control valve. <clears throat> the reason for that is because that's the job of a control valve. It will dynamically change the pressure loss across itself until it meets the set point that you specify. So again, why do the pump and system curves not operate on the, uh, why do they not intersect at the operating point? <clears throat> Here's the property window for a control valve in AFT Fathom. There are several choices. You can do pressure control valves or you can do flow control valves and you specify a set point. So when you specify that set point, what Fathom is going to do is it's going to change the pressure loss across your control valve until the set point is met. Once the pressure loss and flow rate are known, when your set point is met, the CV value for that valve can be calculated. So here's the really important takeaway on this is that control valves represent what's called a active resistance in a piping system. A active resistance is when anything in your system changes, maybe it's your liquid heights. Um, maybe you have more frictional buildup. Maybe you have an orifice plate somewhere. Well, your control valve is going to constantly always respond to your system changes in order to continue meeting that set point no matter what. And that's going to have a very significant aspect on how you go about generating the system curve. So here's a really good example that demonstrates the active resistance of a control valve. And the best way to see that is with using the AFT Fathom XTS module. So let me go ahead and open up that model here really quick. Let's see, pressure sustaining valve with XTS. All right. Just opening up the model here. All right, so here's my system. And in the system here, what I've done is I have turned on the XTS module. So the way that you do that is if you go down here and click on the button just to the left of the status light, click on that, I've turned on the XTS module. That allows me to do transient modeling within AFT Fathom. It's not water hammer, but what's really useful is being able to see how systems change over time, over the long period. And also you can model finite open and closed tanks with XTS. That will allow you to see your liquid heights 
changing over time. And that's exactly what this system is going to do. I've got a finite tank here with a fixed amount of fluid initially. And then if I cancel out of there, my discharge tank is initially empty. And I'm going to be filling up this tank over time. So that's all that we're doing. We're just taking the pump. We're operating it at 100% speed. It's going to operate along its curve during the entire transient. And I have a pressure sustaining valve. This pressure sustaining valve is going to control my upstream pressure to 210 PSIA. All right. So as my supply tank drains and my discharge tank level increases, my control valve is going to change position to keep maintaining that set point. And I am running my model for uh, a five minute period and a time step of every 15 seconds. So we're going to see what happens there. Now, while that's running, I'm going to open up one of my folders here on the side. All right. So the first thing that we want to take a look at is how is that pressure sustaining valve changing? So if I go to the valve transient tab, this is looking at the very first data point at time zero. Well, I want to expand this. So as we can see here at every single time step, our set point is exactly the same, but the CV value is changing and the pressure drop is also changing as well as the flow. So here when we have this particular aspect, if I plot uh, the pressure drop, you can see how the pressure drop changes over time. If I go back to my slide here, one of the things that I did was I uh, created a spreadsheet and I plotted the change in liquid surface elevation for the tanks over time. So the way that I did this was in Fathom, I went to the graph results window and for transient, I did reservoir and then that's the two reservoirs and we'll take a look at the liquid surface elevation. So here you can see how the liquid surface elevation for these two tanks is changing over time. If you were to subtract those two curves, you could calculate how the static head changes over time. That's the gray curve right here in the PowerPoint slide. So when that static head changes, you can see that your system curve is also going to change. <coughs> All right. So there's two ways to generate your pump and system curve here. One way is to in, uh, I didn't want to generate it from scratch. The reason why is because I've got my annotations here. So what I did was I created a pump and system curve for the pump on my workspace. And here's option number one, exclude the pressure loss across the control valves. And so I am not including the pressure loss across that particular control valve when I generate my pump and system curve. So my initial flow rate for the system before my tanks start draining and filling, the operating point is at right around 1,007 gallons per minute. That's the initial flow. So as you can see, the curves are clearly not intersecting at that operating flow rate. Well, if we took the difference between those two curves, which I have outlined right here, the difference is about 20 feet. That is going to be the head loss across our control valve. So if we go back to the output window and we look at the junction results, here's my head loss across the control valve, just about 20 feet. So the moral of the story is, this is probably the better way to generate a pump and system curve 
when control valves are present in your system. The reason why is because that every single uh, change in flow rate as my static head changes, the control valve is going to change its own pressure loss to keep giving me that same set point. And so that is why it's called a active resistance because no matter what happens in your system, that's going to add additional frictional resistance along this whole system curve generation process. And that's why the curves will not intersect at the operating point. The other way is to include the pressure loss across the control valve. So if I uncheck that box, look and see how the system curve changes. See how it's a lot more flat in that case? Let me do it this way. <coughs> so I've got the system curves without the control valve. They do not intersect at the operating point with the control valve. They will intersect at the operating flow rate, but I've got a virtually entirely flat system curve. This really does not tell me very much about the resistance in my system. That's what I care about. The reason why is because the control valve is adding its own resistance at every single flow rate to generate this curve. So this is probably not the best way to generate a pump and system curve when you have control valves present in your system. And this is one of the complexities that we're talking about here. When you have control features, it makes it more complicated for generating curves and it's a bit more ambiguous because there's different ways that you can do it. Now, I wrote a blog a while ago on pump and system curves. So if you went to our tips and tricks page and did a search for uh, know your pump and system curves, I do talk about this aspect of when you have control valves in place. So that's where you can find more information there. All right, skipping ahead. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here on the affinity laws. Um, hopefully, you already know what the affinity laws are. And so uh, you can change your pump curve and adjust it with the affinity laws if you're either changing the diameter of your impeller or if you're changing the pump speed. So if you have a system curve, which is your whatever your system is in play, if you're changing either the pump speed or the impeller trim, then you'll be able to see how the pump curve itself shifts along the system curve there. There's also important aspects about the efficiency. The efficiency should not change very much when you change the pump speed. There's a couple reasons for that is if you have a frictionally dominated system where you have lots of frictional resistance to overcome and that's your the majority of your aspect, your system curve is going to parallel ISO efficiency lines. So as you can see here, when you are changing the speed of the pump, you can see how the operating flow rate is changing as well. Well, when you're changing that operating point, your system curve is paralleling this efficiency curve. And that's why for frictionally dominated system, you would probably not see very much change in the efficiency of your pump when you're changing the pump speed. However, if you have a static dominated system where the main job of your pump is to overcome elevation change and you have more of a flatter curve, when you change the pump speed and the operating point, you can see how you're traversing across efficiency lines. So here we'd be going from about 81% efficiency uh, down to about 78%, all the way down to perhaps 58% uh, at really low flow rate. So when you have a static dominated system, your system curve is not going to parallel your ISO efficiency lines. And that's where you will start to see more significant changes on the efficiency of your pump for those types of circumstances. I told you, we got a lot of information here today. Um, this is an example of uh, talking about pumps in parallel. 
when you have pumps in parallel, the flow rates will typically add together, but it's not always going to give you additional flow rate that you might be expecting. Here's a case where it does not. If you have a steep system curve, which is a very frictionally dominated system, again, we have the system curve going through zero, so that indicates that we probably have a closed system. Well, when you have a closed system, if you're turning on additional pumps, it's not generating that much additional flow for you. So whenever you have a frictionally dominated system, that's going to be a case where adding more and more pumps in parallel is not going to help you hardly at all. And that's very similar to the flow serve case study that I showed. In the original operation of that flow serve or that uh, brine injection system, <clears throat> they had five pumps in parallel and they were operating several at the same time. Well, when they were operating several at the same time, each individual pump by itself was operating at a really low flow rate, really, really far away from its best efficiency point. So what did FlowServe do? They figured out different combinations on which pumps they should operate and which ones they shouldn't. And they closed off various flow paths where they only ran maybe one or two pumps at a time. And that's how they were able to get their pumps operating to a lot more uh, higher proximity of uh, their best efficiency point. Now there's some more information here that I need to go through and it is at the top of the or the top of the hour here. Um, again, the, the webinar is being recorded. So if you need to head out of the webinar now, that's perfectly fine. Just come to this point in time in the webinar and the recording and you'll be able to watch the rest of it. For those of you that are able to hang with me, uh, you'll see some more good information here. Now this is a system where you will have some more increases in flow rate for pumps in parallel, and that's when you have a more static dominated system. So the flatter your system curve is with mainly having to overcome elevation changes, that's where adding more and more pumps in parallel would be potentially advantageous when you wanna generate more flow. All right. Now, when you have pumps that are dissimilar, you've got two different pump curves. This is one of the things that will start to cause your pump and system curve generation behavior to be more complicated. Now, I'm not gonna go into a lot of information, but I wanna show you where you can find more detail about how AFT Fathom is generating the composite pump curve with two pumps that are operating together. So if you were to go into AFT Fathom and go to the help menu, you can open up the help file and do a keyword search for uh, pump and, and system. Well, that brings up a whole bunch of uh, topics. Let's look at enhanced. So there's this particular topic here that is really important. Pump and system curve methods. The way that the composite curve for the pump, when you have multiple pumps in parallel is generated, as well as the com composite uh, system curve, it's not gonna be as clear because of the way that the flow splits through the multiple pumps in parallel. So if you were to open up the help file, this topic here will provide more information about how the pump and system curves uh, are generated when you have pumps in parallel. So be sure to read through that and fully understand that there are some major complexities involved when you're trying to develop composite pump and system curves in parallel. All right, now I wanna get into this particular circumstance here. Let's talk about a system curve where you've got multiple branches and each branch leads to a tank at a different liquid surface elevation. This example comes from the pump handbook. So this is where you will have ambiguities in generating the system curve. Should you allow reverse flow when generating the curve? That's one of the questions. 
The reason why that's an important question is because if you have reverse flow through the system, you know, there are limiting cases where your liquid heights, you may not have forward flow at low flow rates when you're trying to generate your system curve. And so whether or not you allow reverse flow, that's gonna change what your system curve looks like. Also, your flow split to each branch may not be the same at all flow rates. And then lastly, what's the static head? Well, you've got three different liquid surface elevation references. Which one are you gonna use? Well, it all depends on how you're generating the pump and system curve. So this is probably what your system curve would look like in that case. And uh, so here we have this system from the pump handbook. And the, the way that the pump handbook describes how to generate a system curve is to consider each individual flow path by itself. Look how much of a mess this is. Who wants to do that? Well, Fathom will do it for you, but this is where it's important to understand how Fathom is doing this. So let me go ahead and jump to that model really quick here. Okay. So this is another case where I have used the XTS module, but it's to simulate uh, changing flow rate over time for a pump. So here, this system simulates the multi-branch system from the pump handbook, and I have check valves in each of these flow paths. Now the check valves are lossless. They all have K factors of zero. They are simply in place to close if you have reverse flow from any of these uh, reservoirs at a high liquid surface elevation. Now, the other system on the right over here, it also has check valves, but I have turned on the special condition to fail those check valves open. So if we were to look at any of those check valves there, I'll open up one of them here. I went to the optional tab, and I set it to be open. So this system right here on the right is to simulate allowing reverse flow through the system when we wanna generate a system curve. Now, why did I turn on the XTS module? It's because I'm going to generate a system curve manually in this particular case. So I started at a really low flow rate of 0.01 gallons per minute and then my flow rate is going to increase over time from zero to 600 seconds, and I'm going from zero to 6,000 gallons per minute. So when you're using the sizing option here with the fixed flow rate, Fathom is going to run the model at each of these flow rates here, and it's gonna calculate the required pump head that's needed to deliver each of these flow rates. So this is going to generate my system curve manually. And then this system is the same where I'm changing the pump flow rate in the same fashion, but instead I'm allowing reverse flow through the system here. So when you run those together, you can manually determine a system curve and see what that looks like. So while that's opening up, I actually have a Excel spreadsheet where I plotted the systems together. So let me go ahead and open that up here. All right. Um, it might be taking just a little bit longer because of the uh, webinar causing a lag, but it looks like it's moving along okay. So we're almost uh, through the run here. Okay, so the first thing that I wanna show you is the output. So if we take a look at the transient behavior for the pump, there's all these warning messages. You could ignore this for right now. Um, it, they mean different things. The main thing to focus on is the uh, pumps and how they operate. So if I was to take a look at this pump right here, I've got my volumetric flow rate 
at each time step. And I've also got my pump head at each time step. So what I did was I copied this data into my Excel spreadsheet and I plotted the pump head versus flow for one curve. And then I did the same thing for the other pump. This is the pump where I've got my head versus or my head versus flow for the system that is ignoring the check valves. That's where they're failed open and I've got reverse flow. So when I plotted those two systems together, here's the curve that I was ever able to generate. <coughs> As you can see, there are two system curves for the same exact system. There's nothing different about those two systems in terms of their frictional resistance. The only difference is that in one system, I'm allowing reverse flow at low flow rates down here versus the blue curve where I'm allowing my check valves to close, which prevent reverse flow. So what happens is if I'm looking at the orange curve here, this is similar to the one that you would see right here, the, the bumpy curve. You know, Fathom is going to calculate a certain static head. You know, in this particular case, the static head is about uh, 25 feet. Well, how does Fathom calculate a static head of 25 feet because it's really hard to figure out what the static head should be based upon the liquid elevation differences. Is it the liquid elevation difference from this tank or this one or this one, or maybe some sort of average? It's actually not any of those. So here's what happens when we allow reverse flow through any of those branches at low flow rates is when Fathom is running the model over and over again at the whole range of flows, let's say at 0 0.01 gallons per minute, that's a head of 25 feet. Well, if I was to run that scenario individually, you would see reverse flow through a couple of the reservoirs. So if I go back into my Fathom model here, I can go to the graph results tab and I'm going to do a uh, flow right through the branch path where reverse flow is allowed. So look at that. I specified a design alert for a minimum flow rate of zero. So at each of these <coughs> flow rate ranges, as my flow rate increases, I've got reverse flow through two of the flow paths and I only have flow positive to one of the tanks. What that means is if I go to the workspace here, I only have flow leading to one discharge reservoir. So when these control valve or when these check valves here are all failed open and it allows reverse flow to happen, I have reverse flow here, reverse flow here, and then at 0 0.01 gallons per minute, Fathom requires a pump head of about 25 feet that is simply to prevent reverse flow in this path here. So this is where a system curve is not really that useful because it tells you nothing about the distribution of the flow through the system. I only have flow through this particular path here. So which curve is correct? The answer is it's both of them. The thing that you have to ask yourself though is, is your system allowed to experience reverse flow or not? If it's allowed to have reverse flow, then you're gonna see a curve for what the orange curve looks like. If you are uh, not allowing reverse flow where you have a uh, check valves that can close, then that's what the blue curve is gonna look like for your system. Now, we have a static head that's negative. What this means is I have a higher supply reservoir elevation than one of my discharges. So in that particular case, I don't need a pump to generate any forward flow for any flow rate up to about this value right here. So in that particular case, a pump isn't gonna do anything for you. So that's what we mean by a negative head is the elevation differences simply will generate forward flow. However, where this curve is helpful is again, 
you can see where your pump is operating in proximity to the best efficiency point. Again, you want to make sure that you're between your preferred operating region. So this is the system that I used to generate the two different system curves that you might see. But this gets to be a little bit more sticky when you are allowing your tanks to change over time. So let me go ahead and open up that model really quick here. So in this particular system, down in the bottom right hand corner, this uses the XTS module again, and I'm simply operating the pump at 100% speed. I have a finite supply tank, and I have finite discharge tanks here. And what I did was I ran this system that I've circled over time, and you can see how the system changes during the uh, transient, which I can't remember how long I'm running the simulation for, uh, 10 minutes every 15 seconds. So these liquid heights in each of these discharge tanks are going to change. So if I was to run the model, you would see how those change. I'm going to show you the final results here. Um, what I did, this is a bigger spreadsheet here. <coughs> All right. So let's take a look at this tab first. From that model, I was able to calculate how the liquid heights in each of those tanks change over time. So this is my liquid height, and the other one is the liquid surface elevation. So these are how my liquid heights change. This is how the actual liquid surface elevations change. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to generate how my pump and system curve can change over time. Well, here's the thing. If you were to do a pump and system curve for this system where your liquid heights are changing over time, Fathom is not going to be able to give you a dynamic system curve. It's going to generate a system curve at the initial conditions for each of those reservoirs. Okay, so if you want to show how your system curve changes over time, that's where I needed all of the rest of these systems here. Because with XTS, I can calculate exactly what the liquid surface elevation is going to be in each of those reservoirs at each of these particular time steps every two and a half minutes. So that's what I have highlighted in yellow in my spreadsheet here. The yellow highlights are the snapshots in time that I want to generate a system curve for. So when I went back into Fathom, I specified those liquid service elevations as input information for these infinite reservoirs. I was able to calculate a system curve for each of those different systems. And that's this. <laughs> so look at all this data here. This is my pump and system curve information for each of these times, two and a half minutes, five minutes, seven and a half minutes, and 10 minutes. The pump curve is the same. The pump curve doesn't change at all. That's going to stay the same. But if you plot all of the system curves together, this just goes to show how your system curve is going to change over time. And you can see how your operating point is changing. <coughs> Initially, I'm operating right down here. So I'm operating at a about 110% of the best efficiency point. So as my static head in the system changes, my pump operates closer and closer to the BEP, but then it starts to get farther away. Now, again, this is the situation here where the static head, it's allowing the potential to, re to have reverse flow in each of those flow paths. If I was to put check valves in each of those paths, then the system curves would look a lot different. The reason why I mention this is because this is where system curves start to get to be a lot more complicated and maybe not as useful is because they will very quickly start to change. There's ambiguities on how you can generate a system curve uh, because multiple system curves exist and then they will also change over time. 
Now, one other aspect of this is something similar to this type of system where maybe you might have multiple, uh, uh, multiple pumps. So this is basically the same situation I had before, but what I did was at this branch path where I'm splitting flow off to these reservoirs, I have another flow path with a secondary pump. So the reason why I did this is just to illustrate the concept of when you start to have multiple branch paths and multiple pumps in your system, the idea of a system curve that represents the overall total system resistance just completely breaks down. That's because if we go back to our pump handbook here, you can see that when you consider all of the different individual flow paths individually, there's a lot of system curves that can exist for this single system. But what we care about is more of a overall system curve. Well, that just doesn't exist because a system curve is gonna be referenced to a specific point. Well, when you have a system like this, you've got different points that you can generate a system curve for, either the pump or maybe the branch or this pump right here. So if I was to generate a system curve for this particular system, there's gonna be different ones for the different pumps. They're both operating on completely different curves, completely different flow rates. So here's my pump and system curve for one pump. And then I've got a pump and system curve for my other pump. So if I switch between these two different curves, you can see how those two system curves seen by each of those pumps are completely different from each other. Operating point is completely different. This is why the idea of a single unique system curve that demonstrates the overall system resistance for your whole piping network just completely breaks down because there isn't one. You're gonna have different system curves from different vantage points in your network, such as when you have different pumps, and then your system curves are going to be potentially different depending on if you're allowing reverse flow or not. And then finally, if you have finite tanks that you're dealing with, your system curve is going to change as your liquid elevations change over time. And so these are things that you have to understand and consider when you're trying to generate pump and system curves for, not, for more complicated systems. Fathom can do it for you lickety split and super easy, but you have to understand those nuances when you're generating system curves for those types of situations. This is just another example of a spin-off of that system where instead of these being uh, check valves that will close upon reverse flow, you might have different operations. So maybe you're only flowing to tank A or tank B or tank C at different times. That's where you're gonna have different system curves depending on which tank that you're, you're flowing to. But again, if you're flowing to all three, you're gonna have a much different curve when they add together in different ways. All right, so this just summarizes the complexities of uh, system curves where uh, the overall curve, it, it starts to break down um, when you have more complicated networks like I was showing you. Uh, just a few more points here. Uh, this goes to show what your system curve is gonna look like when you're filling up a tank over time, you have an original flow rate, an original total dynamic head. As you start to fill up your discharge tank, your system curve is going to shift with a new static head, and you're gonna have a new flow rate where the pump rides back on its curve. Your frictional head decreases while your static head increases. So this is really important to understand when you have uh, pump and system curves changing over time. There's also where your pump and system curves can change over long periods of time with system degradation. So here, this is a, what your system looks like when it's brand new. Clean pipe, clean pump. 
over time, as your system builds up with corrosion inside the piping, that's going to increase the frictional head that you'll see. So you'll have a steeper system curve. And then if your pump starts to degrade, then your pump curve itself can potentially shift. So now you have an entirely different pump curve and an entirely different system curve and a different operating point. So this is just another thing to understand when you have systems that you're trying to model that have been in operation for a really long period of time. That's how your system and pump curves will change. And again, Fathom will be able to generate that for you uh, with no problem at all. And then the same aspect is similar to when you have uh, system curves over time with control valves. Uh, initially for a clean system, you have more loss across the control valve. Uh, after a long period of time, you have less loss across the control valve. That means as you start to build up more and more friction in your system over time, your control valves are not going to be able to control as well as they used to be able to control. So that's important to understand as well. Now you can easily model all of these different cases with different scenarios, just like I've done in one of my previous models. So if I was to open back up my plant model here, you would be able to model each of these different situations with different scenarios using the scenario manager. Now, I'm not going to show it to you today, but I'm going to show it to you in the next webinar, which is the Excel Export Manager. What you could do right now is you can create these different scenarios, and in each scenario, you can create your various graph list items like how I showed you. So if I open up and I go to my graph uh, here, you can create your graph list items what you can do is set up the Excel Export Manager where when you have graph list items like this, you can automatically send <coughs> these graphs to an Excel spreadsheet. That way you can plot them together. So if you're wanting to plot multiple pump and system curves together, like how I have done, you're going to have to export data into a spreadsheet where you can plot everything together. And that'll do it fairly easily. You can do this for uh, pumps operating at different speeds. You can show how your system curve changes for different liquid levels, uh, old systems versus new systems. Whenever you wanna show different cases and how the operating point changes for those different circumstances, you're gonna have to export those graph list item pieces of data into Excel so that you can plot them together. But here's a little tidbit about Fathom 11. Fathom 11 is coming down the road here, hopefully within the first six months of 2020. That's when we're expecting to have it available. So one of the new features that's coming down the line with Fathom 11 is the ability to do multi-scenario graphing. And that's going to be an outstanding feature because instead of having to do all of your, uh, you will still have to do all of your different scenarios in Fathom, like how I've done here, but rather than having to send your pump and system curve uh, data that you get for your different scenarios into Excel, Fathom 11 is going to allow you to plot the different scenarios together all in the same plot right in Fathom. So that's gonna save you a lot more time rather than having to go into Fathom for all that external plotting. So keep that in mind, make sure that you keep your support upgrade and maintenance agreement renewed so you can get that upgrade when it's available. Uh, one last thing here is if you're generating uh, pump and system curves for pumps in parallel, this is where things get really complicated. So if you have uh, pumps in parallel, there is a new uh, button right here to show graph data generation details. When you click on that from your pump and system curves that are generated, this is going to give you a lot more additional information as to how exactly we are generating those curves. Here's why this is important and why it's complicated. So uh, there are problems that are involved in creating system curves 
for composite pump currents, heat transfer, anything that changes the density. The concept of a single head curve breaks down with density changes. Also, if you have multiple pumps in parallel where your piping is not symmetrical, there's different ways that a system curve can be created. So let me jump to this screenshot here. <coughs> this is a situation where you have three different pumps, three different pumps, three different flow paths. Each flow paths have different resistances. As you can see, each of these pumps are going to operate at different flows and different heads. Well, we've got our total flow through the system from one tank to another, but what about the heads? Well, let's look at what the average head is. The average head is 56 and a half feet in that case. This is why it's not straightforward to generate pump and system curves for uh, systems in parallel like this. So here we have a situation where our operating point, our so-called operating point, is at 2,540 gallons per minute. Well, the average head is 56 and a half feet. This is why this is tricky, is because when you have a complicated system with pumps that are uh, different, or you have different suction and discharge piping, where it's not the same, these flow rates are going to potentially be very different with very different pump heads. So the idea of a single operating point for a composite pump and system curve like this just does not make sense. And so this is what leads to non-uniqueness and ambiguities in generating a system curve for something like that. So that's why once you generate that curve, you can right click on the graph itself and then you can click on that option I showed you earlier to show graph generation details. And this will tell you exactly how we are attributing the flow split through each pump at each composite flow rate to generate that graph. And again, be sure to read that help file discussion on the enhanced method versus traditional method. And that'll explain how we're generating this composite curve for the pump curve and the system curve when you have multiple pumps in series or in parallel. Well, <laughs> that was all a lot of information and I appreciate you all sticking with me. And if any of you wanna go into more detail on some of these aspects, especially for more complicated systems, feel free to contact me, benkeiser at aft.com. I'll be happy to set up another individual webinar with you and show you some more of these different aspects that you'll see for complicated pump and system interactions. Also pay attention to our tips and tricks page. Uh, if you go to our tips and tricks page and you do a keyword search for, uh, well, just do one for pump and system. If you do a keyword search for pump and system curves, you'll be able to find a blog article on Know Your Pump and System Curves Part 1. I'm about to finish up uh, a part, uh, some more uh, uh parts of that blog series that I was writing originally. And so stay tuned to our tips and tricks page here, and you'll be able to read some blog articles where I'm gonna go into more detail about each of those aspects that I demonstrated today. Thank you all very much for your time. Take care and have a wonderful rest of your week.